kick off the 2024 crafting season, I've gathered up some of my favorite projects from 2023 and put them all into one video. I wanted to create a really pretty riser to hold a candle or another piece of decoration. I grabbed some wood beads, some small wooden snowflakes, and one of these large wooden snowflakes and some wooden shapes, all from the Dollar Tree. Before painting my snowflake, I took a small amount of the Dollar Tree spackling and I filled in the hole at the top of the snowflake. I wouldn't need that because I was going to use this as a riser now instead of hanging it up. After the spackle had dried and I smoothed it out, then I got to work giving the snowflake one coat of white chalk paint. I also grabbed four of those wooden shapes that I had. These are in the shape of snowmen, but I'm actually going to use them as the feet for my riser. I gave those a coat of the white ch chalk paint also. If you don't have wooden shapes like this, you could always use more wooden beads. You could either do one wooden bead or you could even stack two or three of them together to make your riser the height that you like. Because of the odd shape of the snowflake, I couldn't really glue four of the snowman just in the four corners because there are no corners. So what I did is I'm going to glue three of them in a triangle shape around the outside prongs of the snowflake and then the fourth one I'm going to glue in the center. That way, whatever I place on my riser will have a little more stability by having one of those little snowman in the center. And you can see here too, with my paint job, I left some of the wood color from the snowflake show through because I like that distressed look but if you like more of a clean modern look you could do more of a full coverage or even several coats of paint. As a second decorative element to my riser I decided to create a small wood bead garland that could be looped around a candle or some other kind of a vase or pitcher. I had a baggie of two different sizes of wood beads so I strung them on until I had the length that I liked. To finish off the ends of my wood beads, I made a tassel using my sanding block and some jute twine. I wrapped it around about 20 times. I cut it in the center and then the two ends of the wood beads I tied together to form the tassel. Once I had all of the strings tied onto the wood beads, then I went down about an inch from where I tied it on and tied another piece of twine around to finish it off. And then as a second decorative element, which you don't have to do this part, I decided to hot glue on one of my wooden snowflakes. That way it really made it more for winter, but if you want to keep something like this up year round, you could just leave the tassel plain. I've had these two winter tags in my stash for a while and I figured they would look really good layered on a wood round. Now this one's from the Dollar Tree so it's a little bit smaller than the other ones but it still works for a great sign. I started by giving the wood round a base coat of white chalk paint. Then I moved on to the two tags. I gave one a base coat of some teal colored paint and the other one I had to give two coats of yellow chalk paint. After my paint was dry, I started creating stripes on the wood round. I'm using painter's tape. I laid a piece down, then I laid a smaller piece down to act as a spacer, and then I placed my next piece of painter's tape. I did this the whole way across until I had stripes going across the surface of the wood round. Once all of my tape was in place, I went back in with that same teal color that I painted the tag with, and I did a heavy dry brushing all over the surface to create some distressed looking stripes. I wanted to create smaller stripes in between the bigger ones, so I'm using some thinner washi tape. After my stripes were good and dry, I placed the washi tape on either side of the stripes to create a smaller center stripe. Once all of the tape was in place, then I went through with the yellow color that I painted on the other tag and I painted my second set of stripes. On the teal tag, I wanted to create some polka dots, so I'm using a pencil eraser dipped in some white chalk paint and I just started placing larger polka dots all over the tag. Once I had all of the larger polka dots in place, I went back through with a dotting tool and I dipped it in the same white paint and created smaller polka dots in between the larger ones. To add a bit of texture to the yellow tag, I'm using a stencil brush or a chippy brush and I'm just dipping it in some white chalk paint and dry brushing it all over the edges to give it a distressed look. Also on the yellow tag, I created a decal using my Cricut with a little birdhouse that says welcome and applied that to the front of the tag. 
There were already two holes at the top of this wood round, which I'm gonna use as the hanger for my sign. I added a bit of hot glue to the end of a piece of jute cord, fished it through, and tied a knot on the front of the sign. Then I did the same thing on the other end of the jute cord and I strung on a few of these black wooden beads that I had in my stash because I thought the black beads would coordinate well with the black decal that I added to the front of the yellow tag. Once I had all of the beads on the jute string, then I just had to run the other end of the jute through the other hole at the top, tie another knot, and cut off the excess. I didn't like that you could still see the holes at the top of my tags, so I grabbed some black ribbon out of my stash. I cut a small piece, tied a knot in the center, dovetailed the ends to create that faux bow tie look that I love so much, and I hot glued a little bow tie to the top of each tag. I layered one tag on top of the other and fastened them together using some hot glue. Then I flipped both tags over and I cut a few pieces of craft stick to fill in the gap where the one tag was on top of the other so that when I went to attach them to the wood round it would be a nice flat surface to glue them onto. To complete this sign, I added a generous amount of hot glue to the back of the two tags and then I placed it in the center of the wood round. I like the simplicity of this framed print from Kirkland's and I knew with a few items I could give it more character and more texture. I found this really large frame at the thrift store. This measures about 16 inches by 26 inches. I liked that it has an inset in the middle and there was no glass for me to deal with. I started by giving that inset portion a thick coat of green chalk paint. While that was drying, I grabbed a pack of these giant craft sticks and a pack of the super jumbo craft sticks. Both of these I get at Walmart. You can see the size difference here and both of them are much larger than the typical tongue depressor size craft stick. If you're using a smaller frame, you could definitely use some of the smaller craft sticks to get the same look, but because my frame was pretty large, I stuck with the bigger craft sticks. I also laid my cutting mat out and I laid a piece of blue tape where uh, the width of my frame would be. So that would give me a guide as I'm laying out my craft sticks about how big the surface was that I had to work with. I started with the giant craft sticks first. These are the bigger of the two craft sticks and I always like to use my paper trimmer anytime I'm cutting down craft sticks because it just gives me the most even cut. I really can't give you many measurements here because depending on what size frame you use, you'll have to use your judgment as to what size you need to cut your craft sticks down to. I started with the largest ones. I cut a bunch of them and I started laying my craft sticks down under my paper trimmer on the surface that I had taped out. If you don't have a big cutting mat like I do, you could just measure out the surface you're working with and lay out a little box using some painter's tape just so you have an idea of how many sticks you're actually going to need to cut down. And then that way you're not gluing them as you're cutting them so you can play around with the layout. I use the Kirk Lynn's photo as my inspiration for most of the layout. I did have to add in a bit at the bottom. So once I had some of my craft sticks cut, then I started laying them out on my craft mat there, giving me an idea of how many sticks I would need and what lengths I would need to cut them to. And because they were down there on my work surface, I was able to just cut a few sticks at a time, work on the layout as I liked it, go back, use my paper trimmer, cut a bit more craft sticks, and it gave me a better idea of the spacing that I would need for each section of my craft sticks. And I did try to, as I was working through the different sections of the craft sticks, I tried to make sure that they were going in different directions and I was using both sizes of craft sticks so that I wouldn't have all of the big ones on one side and all of the small ones on one side. It, it kind of gave it more character and more texture the, the more that I variated the sizes and the directions of the craft sticks. Once I had the pattern all laid out how I liked it, then I went through with some white chalk paint and I just dry brushed all over the surface of each of the craft sticks. I didn't mind if a little paint got on my cutting mat, so it was easier to do it this way just to pick up each stick individually, do my dry brushing, and lay it back down where it belonged. That way I didn't lose where my pattern was going to be. If you're worried about getting paint on whatever surface you're using, I would just lay out your pattern how you like it and then take 
take a picture of it so that you can refer back to it so that you know where you need to lay each stick on your picture frame. Now that all of my sticks have been cut and dry brushed, I could reassemble my photo frame. I started by gathering up each pile of sticks according to size and I laid the pile of sticks down on my surface in the direction that they needed to go. Once all of my sticks were laid back down in their pattern, then I started using some hot glue to glue everything in place. For each group of sticks, I would start at one end, hot glue that end stick down first, then I would move to the other end of the group and glue that stick in place. Then the sticks that were in the middle of the group, I would glue down from each end working towards the middle. That way I could adjust the gaps of the sticks as I was working towards the middle. I didn't mind if the gaps weren't exactly the same throughout the sticks because I did like that there would be a little more green showing through some of the sticks and it did give it more texture that way. I really like how this piece turned out. I'm always looking for ways to create bigger pieces of decor. Sometimes I think, you know, as crafters, we kind of get stuck in a rut where we feel like we're making the same things over and over again. So it was really fun for me to go to the thrift store and find this frame. It was perfect for what I needed it for. And I'm really glad to have a nice big piece of home decor in my home now. I wanted to create a wreath for my front door that has a coastal theme to it. I picked up one of these wooden wreath forms from the Dollar Tree, some of the nautical rope, and I have some of this macrame cord that I get from Amazon. It comes in a really big spool. I'll make sure that it's linked in the description box below. I started by cutting my macrame cord down to eight inch pieces. I found it easier to start with a 16 inch piece, fold it in half, and then cut it down to the eight inch length. Once I had a pretty big pile of those eight inch pieces cut, I started by taking one of them, folding it in half, pulling the loop through the center of the wreath base, and then pulling the ends through that loop. That creates a slip knot around the wreath base, and I just continued doing that until I had the entire wooden ring full of the slip knots of the macrame cord. As I continued filling up the wreath form with the knots, I just made sure that every time I added a new piece of cord, I went in from the same side so that all of the knot side of the two strings would be on the same side, if that makes any sense. I wanted to make sure that the indentation side of the knots was always facing upward towards me. After the wooden ring was completely filled with the knots, then I went in through with that nautical rope. This is the blue and white twisted nautical rope. They do sell regular jute colored nautical rope at the Dollar Tree too, but I like this one because it fits in with that coastal theme. And I just ran a bead of hot glue along the indentation side of those knots and I covered that little space up with the rope. I think this wreath looks good as is with just the rope around the center, but I wanted to add a few embellishments to mine. I grabbed a few picks of greenery, a few pieces of ribbon, and some seashells. Most of these things I got from the Dollar Tree. I wanted to keep mine a little simple, so I kept most of the decorations towards the bottom of my wreath, but this is where you could let your style kind of come into play, and you could add shells the whole way around, or add different types of bows or greenery, Whatever you like, this is the perfect base to decorate with. always looking for more storage in my house and reusing cardboard boxes is a great way to do that. I took one cardboard box, some of this white nautical rope from the Dollar Tree, and I actually found this piece of fabric at Joanne Fabrics. It was on the remnant cart and I really liked the coastal print on it. I started by taking my box flaps and hot gluing them to the inside of the box. I used some clips to hold them into place while the glue set. I like doing it this way because I feel like it gives 
more sturdiness to the sides of the box. After I had the two longer sides of the box glued into place, before I glued the shorter sides inward, I just cut a small triangle off of each side so that when I folded the side flap in there, it wasn't rubbing up against the other flaps and it took some of that bulk out. I can't really give you any kind of measurements for the material because it's all going to be based on how big your box is. For my box, I laid my box on top of my material and I made sure that when I folded the material up over all four sides, it completely covered all of the inside of the box and went down into the bottom of the box. I wasn't worried about some of the bottom showing through because I am going to create another panel to slip down inside. I just wanted to make sure that all of my sides would be covered with material. When I added my hot glue, I made sure that I was only adding hot glue on the inside of the box. This is pretty thick material, but I was still afraid that some of the glue would ooze out through and you would be able to see it from the outside. So I just made sure that all of my hot glue stayed towards the inside. Once I had my two longest sides glued into place, I started working on the shorter sides and and as I was folding the material up, I would kind of pinch it with my hands where there would be some excess so that I could cut it away and it wouldn't be so bulky once I folded it up. After I had some of the excess cut away, then I could just pleat the material as neat as I could and fold it up over the edges and then hot glue it into place. Because you could still see some of that cardboard through the bottom of the box, I wanted to create another panel that I could just slip down inside. I cut a piece of chipboard down to fit inside of my box and I took another piece of that material and I just covered one side of the chipboard with the material. I did the same thing where I would glue both of the longer sides in. I would cut out a little bit of excess material just to make sure there was no bulk in there before I folded the shorter side sides towards the middle of the chipboard. Once the whole panel was covered in that material, then I could just slide it right into the bottom of my box and you didn't see any more cardboard. I wanted to keep the decorations on this box pretty simple because it does have a pretty busy print. I started with two lengths of the nautical rope that I folded in half and I laid one piece of rope out so that the loop was facing to the right. I took the other length of rope and I pulled the two ends through the loop and then once the loop was almost the whole way through I pulled the ends of the left loop through the second loop. I know that seems a little complicated. I'm going to do it a second time so you can watch it again, but it's pretty easy and it creates a pretty simple knot. Of course, you don't have to do this knot at all. You could just create a regular bow with the rope and I think that would look cute too. Once I had my knot tied, then I took the longer side of the box and I hot glued the knot into place first. I went around all of the edges and I just added hot glue on the corners because I didn't want to run the risk of any of the hot glue seeping through the rope and you being able to see it through the ropes. So I would just add a little bit on the corners as I was going around and pulling it tight. Once I got to the back side, I cut the excess length of rope off and I added some hot glue and pinched the ends together. I knew that I would keep this box where you wouldn't see those unfinished ends, edges, but if that's something that bother you, you could always cover that up with another piece of decoration. The Dollar Tree always carries tag shaped signs and I'm always drawn to them. I seem to have an overabundance of them. I grabbed one of the signs to use as a background and I also had two of these mini drawers that I also found at the Dollar Tree. I flipped the sign over and I'm giving it one coat of green chalk paint. After my paint was dried the whole way, I took my sanding block and I started roughing over the edges. I wanted it to have a worn look, but I didn't want that distressed look that you get from paints. And because this is a wood sign, I knew that if I sanded off a little bit of that paint, some of that wood would show through to give it that distressed look that I like. 
Using my ruler, I found the center of the sign, added a pencil mark, and then I also found the center of the backside of the drawer. And I ran a pencil line the whole way down the backside of the drawer so that when I went to glue it in place, I would have a guide. I could just line up the two lines and I would know where I needed to glue my first drawer. For the top drawer, I just eyeballed how far apart I wanted it from the bottom drawer and then I repeated the same thing. I marked on the sign where the center was and then I marked the center back of the drawer, added some hot glue, lined my two marks up together and glued it into place. I grabbed some of the cotton twine that you can find at the Dollar Tree. This usually isn't in with the crafting stuff. It's usually found in the automotive section. I cut a length off and I folded it in half, I fished the loop through the top hole of the tag, pulled the ends through and let them hang to the side. Then I grabbed my sanding block and I wrapped the cotton twine around my sanding block about 25 times or until I felt like it was thick enough for a tassel. Then I pulled the string down that I had attached to the top of the tag and I tied a knot where I wanted the tassel to hang from. Once I had my knot in place, I strung on three wooden beads. I added just a tiny dot of hot glue over the knot so that the top bead would stay in place over the knot. Then with the two strings that were coming out from the bottom of the wooden beads, that's what I used to tie on my tassel. And that way the strings from the ends of that rope coming out from the top of the tag would be hidden within the tassel itself. And then I just finished off the tassel with another piece of the same twine wrapping it around about an inch from the top of the tassel. In order to make sure there wasn't too much weight in each of the drawers, I put a big chunk of floral foam inside first, and then I added some of the decorative white rocks that you can find at the Dollar Tree. Once I had the surface of the floral foam hidden with the rocks, then I just tucked a succulent into each drawer. Over the summer, we have a lot of picnics and cookouts up at my pap's house, and he used to drive a truck pretty much my whole life. It was a 63 Ford and it was green and he loved that truck. And so I wanted to take these two truck cutouts that I had in my stash and create a condiment caddy that I could take up to the picnics and cookouts at his house. Also with the two trucks, I am gonna use one of the small wooden trays that you can find at the Dollar Tree. Now because his truck was green, I wanted to make sure that my caddy was green as well. This isn't quite the green of his truck, but it's close enough. And I made sure that I painted the front and back sides of both of the trucks and the inside and the outside of the tray too, all with the same color. My pap owned his own plastering business, so his green truck was his work truck as well. So even though it was green, it had a lot of splashes of white on it just from all the plaster that he hauled around and used all the time. So I took a chippy brush and some white chalk paint and I dusted it all over the edges of both the trucks and the tray itself. My pap had the name of his business on the side of his truck, so I used my Cricut to create a small decal that I could put on each of my trucks. It says Paul Devan Plastering, and then I was able to assemble all three of the pieces. Because we will be using this outside for picnics, I wanted that long-term, short-term hold, so I added some wood glue to the edges of the tires, and then I added hot glue to the center of the crate, and I just held it in place until I was sure that hot glue was set. I glued the first truck on, and then I glued the backside truck on, making sure that it lined up as best as I could, and this is a perfect piece to hold the condiments for our picnics. Now, it's still winter here in PA, so I'm not able to take this out outside and seal it but once it gets a little bit nicer I do plan on adding a clear coat to this just to make it a bit more weatherproof. Started. 
This pumpkin sign really caught my eye on the Kirkland's website and I knew I could recreate it using Dollar Tree items. I started out with one of their wooden pumpkins that they come out with every year. This is just a plain flat pumpkin. I also had a wooden arrow on hand and I wanted to show you that if you have these metal welcome signs from the Dollar Tree that would fit perfect on the arrow too. But I decided to make a decal using my Cricut instead, but I wanted to give you the option because I know not everyone has a Cricut. I started by painting my two wooden pieces first. I'm going to leave the rope attached to the wooden arrow because I'll be able to use that later. I just used a piece of painter's tape on the back to hold it down so that I wouldn't get paint on it. I'm using the truffle color by Wavery... Waverly, I gave that one coat on the arrow and I also gave my pumpkin one coat of white chalk paint. After the paint had dried on my pumpkin, I used a pencil and using the bottom of the pumpkin as a guide, I drew some lines going from the bottom of the pumpkin up towards the stem just to define the curve of the pumpkin a bit. I'm using a pencil here because I knew it would take me a couple attempts to get the lines how I like them and I was able to erase the ones that I didn't like. Now, if you chose to paint your pumpkin in a different color, maybe orange, instead of using a pencil here, you could use a piece of white chalk and that would do the same thing. Once I had the lines how I like them, I'm using the mineral color by Waverly and a pretty thin paintbrush. I took most of the excess paint off of the brush before I started filling in those lines. And because this color is so similar to the pencil line, I wasn't worried if you saw a little of that pencil line through there, but I did put it on light enough that you couldn't really see the pencil through the paint. Using the same color mineral, I took a bigger, chippier brush and I'm dry brushing the same color around the edges of the pumpkin. And then just to blur out those center lines a little bit so they wouldn't be so prominent, I did take the same chippy style brush and I dry brushed over the surface of those lines as well. Using the small brush again, I defined the stem a bit more with the same mineral color. I didn't worry if the line connecting the stem was perfect. I just drew a little arc on with my brush and then filled in the rest of the stem with the color. And the last thing I needed to paint was the arrow. The base coat was already dry, so using the same mineral color, I just dry brushed around the edges to give it that distressed look. At the top of my pumpkin, I wanted to place a bow. I had this burlap and lace ribbon in my stash. I'm pretty sure this is from the Dollar Tree also. I looped one piece around so that it was the width that I wanted the bow to be, and I cut another piece to act as the tails. I accordion pleated them both in the center, and then I just used a piece of jute cord to tie them together. Before attaching the bow to the top of the pumpkin, I grabbed some of this berry garland that I already had and I cut a length to wrap around the stem and then the extra tails that were hanging, I just used a, a little tool that I had and I wrapped it around to give it a corkscrew look. Then I just used some hot glue and I hot glued the bow right over top of the berry garland. Uh, once it had dried just a bit, then I pulled those corkscrews down so they looked like they were coming out through the bottom of the bow. Before attaching my arrow to my pumpkin, I did add the decal that I had created on my Cricut. I wanted to show you that you could use that welcome sign that you get in the three pack from the Dollar Tree as well because the Kirkland's pumpkin actually did say welcome on it, not pumpkin patch. But I thought it would be cute since I was using an arrow instead of just a plank of wood if it said pumpkin patch. Then because I did leave that rope attached to the arrow, I just had to cut it in half. I laid everything face down so that I could line the arrow up on the pumpkin and I added some hot glue, placed the rope that was already attached into the hot glue and just to make sure it was extra secure, I added a piece of clear tape over each piece of rope. I created a hanger for this sign just by taking a small piece of jute cord. I hot glued one end to each side of the base of the pumpkin and of course I always like to add clear tape just to make sure it's nice and sturdy. Hanging 
garlands are one of my favorite things to create. So when I saw this pumpkin garland on the Kirkland's website, I knew I had to make one for myself. I'm using a pack of the wooden pumpkin ornaments from the Dollar Tree. There's eight in a pack. I'm going to need a chalk marker and I picked out four of my favorite colors of paint. Three of them are Waverly in moss, hazelnut, and pumpkin. And the fourth one is a dark blue one from folk art that I got at Michael's. And I believe the color is called nautical. Since there's eight pumpkins in this pack, I painted each color on two of the pumpkins. After all my pumpkins had a chance to dry, I took my chalk marker. This is just a chalk marker from the Dollar Tree. I've had it for a while and I've had really good luck with it. It always turns out really nice. I haven't had trouble with the tip fraying or anything like that. And it's a nice opaque white. I never feel like it's too translucent. Now here you can kind of decide how you want your pumpkins to look. The ones from Kirkland had a bit more detail on them. I decided to go with kind of a quirky pattern on mine. I would do a little squiggle line and and then a dot and I repeated that pattern the whole way around the pumpkin and then I also used that pattern to define the center curves of the pumpkin as well. You could go with something basic with just like straight lines or even just stitch marks but I like the sort of quirkiness that the wavy lines give the pumpkins. I think these pumpkins are so cute and if you have a tree that you like to decorate for all the different seasons I think these would make really cute ornaments on a fall tree because they do have holes at the top if you wanted to tie yours on to your garland you could do that I wanted to just glue mine right to the rope so that when I hang it it would make sure that all of the pumpkins were facing forward sometimes when I tie things onto a garland they have a tendency to shift around and sometimes you kind of see the side view but because these are really really flat I wanted them to stay facing forward so that's why I added just a bit of hot glue right at the base of the stem and I laid the rope into the glue to make sure that they would all be facing the same direction once I hung it up Dollar Tree always has great wood blanks for every season and holiday and I was really excited to see that they had wooden acorns this year too. In addition to two of those wooden acorns I'm going to be using some of the faux leather that the Dollar Tree also carries and some nautical rope that I got from Amazon. Before I got started painting on the acorns, I took a scrap piece of cardstock and I'm just tracing the top of each acorn on the cardstock. I then flipped it over and I used the same curve that's at the top of the acorn to create a curve at the bottom of the acorn so that my acorn will look like it has a little cap. I cut it out with scissors and then I got to work on the body of the acorn. I started by giving each of my acorns a good base coat of white Waverly chalk paint and once that paint was dry I went back through with the color hazelnut and I'm just using a dry brush technique. I'm focusing more along the edges but I did add a little bit of the paint through the body of the acorn also. To create the cap for my acorn, I'm using that piece of cardstock that I had made the pattern out of. I placed it on the back side of the faux leather. I traced it out with a Sharpie and then I cut it with scissors. Now one thing to remember here is you want the because the stem is slanted to one side, if you're tracing on the back side like I am, you want to make sure that you flip your pattern over so that the stem will line up with your wooden acorn. This faux leather from the Dollar Tree is pretty thin and I was afraid if I attached it with hot glue you would be able to see the glue through the leather. So instead I'm using some double sided tape here. This is pretty strong adhesive. I get it from Amazon. It's called score tape. I use it all the time in my paper crafting. I just applied a good bit of it on the top of the acorn where the faux leather would go. And then right around the edges where I wasn't too worried about the hot glue that's where I added a little extra hot glue for extra security. Now I'm using my nautical rope to outline the cap of my acorn and you can see here I started slightly off center at the bottom of the acorn and I like using this nautical rope from Amazon a little bit better than the Dollar Tree one because it's just a little thinner and I think it's a little bit easier to work with. I just worked in small sections the whole way around the cap. Um, I added a little line of hot glue and then I would place the rope into it and hold it for a second or two until it's set. It was a little tricky around the stem area because of the sharper corners, but because this rope is thinner, it was easier to work with. 
When I got around to the other side, I left just a small gap in between the two ends of the nautical rope, and that's because I wanted to tie a bow, so I wanted that gap there so that the knot of the bow could fit inside there and not get too bulky. I just tied a simple shoelace style bow out of the same nautical rope, and I used hot glue and I glued it right into that gap. I wanted my acorns to stack on top of each other, so before I started adding the nautical rope to the second acorn, I laid my first acorn down where I wanted it to be, and I just used the pencil to mark where I needed the rope. I didn't want the rope to lay underneath the first acorn because it would create a slight gap and make it look a little uneven. So you can see here, I started with my first pencil mark, and I'm doing the same process. I'm just adding a little bit of hot glue at a time, and I'm running around the whole way until I reach my second pencil mark. This worked out well too because now I know exactly where I need to put my first acorn at so I'm just using a good amount of hot glue all along the edge there and through the center where the two acorns would touch and I was able to just slide it into place. I think you could stop here because I think these two acorns are so cute on their own, but I do have a Cricut, so I decided to cut out a small decal for the bottom acorn. It just says fall is in the air. This is available right in the Cricut design space if you have a Cricut too, and I just applied it with some permanent vinyl. I found these felt acorns at the Dollar Tree this year and I thought they were so cute and I thought they would look great on a wreath with some felt flowers. In addition to these felt acorns, I'm also gonna be using a grapevine wreath form, some of this beaded berry garland that you can get at the Dollar Tree, a few sheets of felt and some leftover stems from a flower bouquet. I don't like to glue anything to my grapevine wreath form because they are a little bit pricey, so I want to be able to reuse it. So instead of gluing anything right to the wreath, I'm gonna create a base out of the two acorn picks that I have. I just joined the two stems together. I gave them a little bend so they would match the curve of the wreath form. And then using some zip ties, I just attached the two together so that everything else I wanna add to this wreath, I can add right to these two acorn picks rather than putting it directly on the wreath. I'm going to start by creating some felt leaf type things for on my wreath. I laid my ruler out and I lined the edge of my piece of felt up at the one and a half inch mark and I cut a strip the whole way up. I didn't bother marking it or anything. It didn't have to be exact. I just wanted it to be about one and a half inches the whole length. Then I took my scissors and I'm cutting fringes the whole way down the length of this piece of felt. I stayed about a quarter to a half an inch away from the other end so that I wouldn't get it disconnected. The one tip that I have is make sure you're using a pretty good pair of fabric scissors for this because felt can be a little tricky to cut through. So if you're using fabric scissors, it'll make it a little bit easier. I'm sure you're like me and you probably have some of these flower bouquets laying around that only have maybe one flower left on them and you don't know what to do with all these stems that have no leaves or flowers left. So I took one of those bouquets out. I took the flower off that was left on it and I clipped one of the stems off to make my new felt flower. I started at the top with a little hot glue and I just wound it the whole way down until I got to the bottom and I added a little more hot glue right at the bottom bottom and tuck the end in. I love creating this type of felt flower pick because it can kind of mimic different things. Because of this green color that I chose, it reminded me of a fern, but if you used a darker green, it could remind you of pine also. Next, I got to work on the flowers that I wanted to create. So I grabbed some of the white felt that I had in my stash. And again, I laid my ruler down. This time I lined the end of the felt up with the three inch mark. Then I used my hot glue to run a small bead of hot glue along one edge of the felt piece and I folded it in half so that the two ends were joined together and the other end formed a loop. Then I kind of re repeated the same process as I did the first time. This time starting on the loop side, I'm cutting fringes into the other side of the felt. And because that hot glue was there, it gave me a little stopping place to stop my fringes. Again, it was about a quarter to a half an inch from those two ends that were joined together. And I just did that the whole way down the length of the piece of the felt. 
This flower starts off the same. I just added a little hot glue to one end and I added in my flower stem. But this time, instead of winding the flower down the stem, I'm staying in the same place. So you can see here, as I'm winding it up, I'm making sure that the bottom lines up with the piece that I had just rolled into it. So basically it's just forming a big roll and then those loops that are on the other side will fan out and form the flower. After I rolled up the whole length of the felt, then I added more hot glue and just atta attached it to the other end. I then took my wire cutters, I clipped off the excess wire stem, and I added hot glue all over the bottom of this flower so that everything will stay in place. And once that hot glue has a chance to set, you can see how those loops form this really pretty flower that kind of reminds me of a mum. I made several of the flowers and those fern-like picks that I had showed you earlier. And once I had all of those finished, then I just started placing them on top of my two acorn bunches. I can't really give you exact directions to this because it'll just depend on your style and your preference. I just started with the green picks first as my base layer and I hot glued those to the acorn stems wherever I thought they looked good. Then I placed the flowers where I wanted them. As an extra little embellishment for my wreath, I took some of that beaded berry garland. I cut a piece off and wrapped it around something I found in my craft room to create a corkscrew. Then I cut that down into smaller pieces and I just tucked it in here and there where I thought the wreath needed a little extra texture. Once I had my base decorated how I liked it, I laid it on top of my grapevine wreath and using some zip ties again, I just fed it through the stems of the acorn picks and I attached it to the wreath. So this is a great way to reuse these wreaths. You just create everything on a base and then attach it. This milk and cookies sign from Kirkland's really caught my eye and I knew I could recreate it with a few things from the Dollar Tree. I went to the wooden section of the Dollar Tree and I grabbed one of these wooden arrow signs. I also grabbed one of the wooden plaques that they have. You can find these at Michael's too, but any kind of wooden base will do. Then I went to Walmart and I grabbed a three pack of wooden dowels. These are 12 inches long and they're nice and thick. And I'm also gonna be using some jingle bells. I'm using a combination of wood glue and hot glue to attach my wood dowel to my wood base. I added some wood glue to the center of the dowel and then I added the hot glue around it. That way the wood glue will make sure that it's nice and sturdy for the long term, but the hot glue will hold it in place quickly for right now. After I had that centered on my plaque, then I took some hot glue and I went right around the edges and I wasn't worried because I knew I would cover that up later. I made sure that that hot glue was nice and cool to the touch and not tacky anymore before I started painting. I left the arrow separate for now, but I did paint all of the pieces in red. So I'm using some red chalk paint here and I gave everything one coat. My paint was pretty thick, so all I needed was one coat. But if you see a little bit of wood through your paint, you might wanna do two coats. I'm using my Cricut to create the lettering for on my sign, but if you don't have a Cricut, you could try handwriting it with a paint marker, or there's enough surface area on that wooden arrow that you could pick up some letter stickers from Michael's or Hobby Lobby in the scrapbook section and use those instead. I'm using a white paint pen that I got from the Dollar Tree. You'll have to let me know if you've tried their paint pens before. I was really impressed with the coverage that this one had. I've used chalk markers in the past and I've always felt like they've been a little too sheer. So for example, I'm using this on a red surface and when I've tried to use chalk markers in the past, it's left it looking pink rather than white, but this had a nice opaque finish to it. So you can see here, I'm just taking my time and I'm outlining the entire arrow with my white paint pen. If you feel like you don't have a steady enough hand to create a solid line like this, you could always create dots or dashes around the outside and I think that would look cute too. I'm going with the wood glue, hot glue combo again to attach my arrow to my wood dowel. You can see here I practiced with that paint pen on the back side of my arrow before I moved to the front. I laid my arrow down on a spool of ribbon so that it was elevated enough to be even with the dowel rod and then I stuck the dowel onto the arrow and I used some more hot glue to reinforce the outsides of the dowel rod to make sure that it was extra secure. 
but I was still worried that it wasn't going to be held on well enough with just the glue. So I dug around in my craft stash and I did find some red burlap ribbon that blended in pretty well. And I just added more hot glue over to the backside and laid the ribbon on it to give it a little extra security. I wanted to add a few little embellishments to my sign. I'm using one of these garland ties. They're wired, so I just wrapped it around the dowel rod part and I just slid it to the bottom to help cover up that hot glue that was around the base. If you don't have a garland tie, this would also be a great place that you could add some glue and some fake snow. I think that would be cute too. Next, I started for the top of my sign. I'm using some jute twine here. I added a little hot glue to the end and rolled it between my fingers so that it would be easier to string on my jingle bells. I took five of the jingle bells and I just strung them onto the jute cord. Once I got to the fifth one at the end, then I went back through the top and I strung them back going the other way so that it would create a dangle of jingle bells at the top of my sign. I know the Dollar Tree makes some really big jingle bells that come in different colors and I think those would look cute tied at the top of this too. I tied my jingle bells on with the tails of the twine that I had used to string them and then to finish it off I took two lengths of the same jute twine and I just created a simple bow at the top. My Dollar Tree just got a plus section this year. So when I saw this faux for wreath, I was so excited because I think it is so pretty. So in addition to that wreath form, I'm also going to be using one of the really large stretched canvases from the plus section. These come in a two, two pack and you can see that they're 16 inches by 20 inches. And I'll also need some Christmas ribbon. To make the background for my wreath, I took one of my wider paint brushes and I laid it across my canvas and I just used a pencil to create marks giving me a pretty good idea of how wide I would need to make my stripes. So normally I like to tape off my stripes but I wanted this to have a more rustic feel to it so instead of taping off the stripes and making them perfect I'm just using the width of my paintbrush to act as my guide for the width of my stripes. And you can see here too as I drag the paint down the canvas I'm not creating solid stripes. I'm leaving some of that canvas come through almost to make it look like I dry brushed on the stripes. Once my vertical stripes were dry, then I did the same thing going in the opposite direction. I laid down my paintbrush and added a pencil mark so that I would have a rough idea of how wide I needed to make my stripes. And when I do stripes like this, whether I'm just doing them um, kind of rustic or if I am gonna tape them off with painter's tape, I always like to start in the middle to create my guide because then that way I know for sure that the stripes on either end are going to match. I hope that makes sense. It's just always been easier for me when I'm creating things like this to start in the middle. So you can see here I'm just repeating the same process I did as for the vertical stripes but this time they'll be horizontal. And again, I'm not trying to create a solid stripe. I'm trying to leave some of that canvas material come through so that it looks distressed. And also, it's a little hard to see here, but I did pick the canvas up and continue the stripes along the edges also just to give it a cohesive look. I really love how this background turned out and I like that it's a quicker version of a traditional buffalo plaid. Now for the wreath, I did cut the tag off and it already came with a hanging loop. I didn't wanna cut that off in case I decide to use it later in a different project. So I'm just using a piece of clear tape and holding it down. Finishing up this Christmas sign is pretty simple. I cut a length of my Christmas ribbon. You can see I'm just using some peppermint stripe ribbon here. I looped it through one side of my wreath form and just to make sure that it didn't slide around, I'm just using a piece of tape to hold it in place. That way there's not any hot glue on the back of that. Then I laid my wreath on top of my canvas and I took both lengths of that ribbon and wrapped it around to the backside. Now you could use a staple gun here because the frame of this canvas is wood, but I am currently out of staples, so I just used some hot glue to hold my ribbon in place. 
And since the only part of this that has hot glue is just the ribbon at the top, if you wanted to take these apart later to use for future projects, that would be easy too. Thanks for coming to hang out with me again today. I left some videos on the screen that I think you might like. Let me know what kind of crafts you want to see in 2024. All right, everyone, have a great week, and I'll talk to you in the next one.